Good morning. Great to gather together here this morning at Calvary Chapel, Jericho Road. Uh, interesting times we live in, there's no doubt. And I read, although you have to be cautious reading too much today, <laughs> but still, you look at what people are reflecting in this culture, and sometimes you wonder, is everybody going crazy? You know, you just see everything just going on. And maybe you come in and they have a lot going on. Maybe you're in a place today where you're kind of wondering, man, what's... Maybe you're in a place with a lot of trials going on in your life. Well, the Thessalonians were exactly there, and we're going to continue to look at what God has for them, and I know he has something for each of us. And so let's turn there. We're in 2 Thessalonians. So turn there in your New Testament to 2 Thessalonians. We're going to pick it up in chapter 2. If you need a Bible, please don't hesitate to raise your hand. You actually want to make sure you have a Bible. You always want to make sure that it's not man's opinion that we're studying or studying, but God's Word. I... I remember when the Lord got hold of this guy, and, and he really broke through, and he really is there, and he really, this really is his word. And so it's not about religiosity or church attendance, it's about us encountering him this morning. And I pray he'll meet you right where you're at. And I, and I trust that he will, because indeed his word is alive and active. Turn to 2 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Whether it be here in the sanctuary, out in the courtyard, or those watching the streaming, God has something for you this morning. So let's just be very sensitive and, and let him minister to us. As we pick it up here now, as we join the Thessalonians in chapter 2, we find that they had been led to believe that they had missed the rapture and entered the Great Tribulation. As a side note, may I mention, because I've said it before, but just to remind us, Paul had only been in Thessalonica some three weeks. And then opposition arose, and he had to finally leave town. And you know, we look at what he writes back to them, and he obviously had taught them about, it, it was a lot. He had really went for it. So it shows us it's very learnable and very appropriate and very important. We dig into each of these things. And in this case, he finds out that they think that they had missed the rapture and that they had now entered the Great Tribulation. As chapter 2 opens, it tells us this resulted in them being shaken in mind and troubled. Paul's about to show them how that had occurred and how to avoid it. He's going to show them and us how to stand fast instead of being shaken. No shortage of things to shake us. No shortage of things to potentially trouble us. And you're going to speak to that this morning. We pick it up in verse 13 where we left last time. We're in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth, to which he called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and Father, who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Therein lies our title for this morning, and the awesome choice and declarations for our lives here. I won't ask you to raise your hand, but if you need comfort this morning, you're going to speak to that. You need some establishing, you're going to speak to that. He's going to help us learn and see where we can stand fast. Towards all that, look at verse 15 again. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or our epistle. And I've called our time together this morning. Stand fast and hold the traditions. Let's pray. Father, how we thank you. The declaration here is how much you have loved us, how we have received from you the everlasting consolation, the good hope, there's comfort, there's establishing in you. Thank you for it all. And you know what we have going on in our lives and our hearts. And you're here to minister, you're here to encourage, perhaps to challenge for some of us, but thank you, Lord, it's all from your love. 
So help us now, Lord. We, we, can be, we can be easily distracted, help that not take place. But in this time, in this place, help us hear from you. So, Lord, by the Holy Spirit, move, Lord. Move here, move each place being watched. Move with all the children, the youth, everybody. Have your way. Help us all to not come short of all you'd have now. We lift us to you, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand fast and hold the traditions is what we called our time. Now, I want to continue here and help us really to set the, the, the table as we come to this verse 13. Let's read what Paul had just written. Remember, the original writings didn't have chapter and verse. We put that in later to help us find different portions of Scripture and study and all. It's just one long letter. But we could never on a Sunday, well, I guess we could, but <laughs> it'd be pretty tough. It'd be hard to go through the whole letter on one Sunday morning because there's so much here. So we stop at certain points, but we always need to understand the context. Let's go back a little bit. Go back to verse 9 for just a moment, where Paul has just written, The coming of the lawless one, that's the Antichrist, is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So Paul writes here of those who, who are perishing. He says they're perishing because they wouldn't receive the love of the truth. He says that they did not believe the truth. But now he's going to contrast those who just wouldn't believe it, wouldn't receive it, didn't want to have anything to do with this truth, God's truth, he now contra contrasts them with the Thessalonians. Look what he writes about them. We pick it up in our verse 13. But we, remember he's writing here, and Timothy and them had already visited, Silas and them had been there, so he's saying, we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth, to which he called you by our gospel, the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. I know there's a lot of terms there that go, wait a minute, what's, what are all those? Let's go slow and consider what he's saying. Look at the progression, he says. He says, these that are lost, they're lost because they didn't want to hear the truth. They didn't want to believe the truth. They didn't want to receive the love of the truth. He said, but you guys are different. God found in you a people who did receive. And look at the progression. He says, you believers, first of all, what's he say? That God, from the beginning, chose you. So first of all, believers are chosen ones. Later on, he's going to say, it's all by grace. We know that full well. We didn't earn this. It's all by his grace and love. Whosoever will, he says, come. And in that mercy, he, he's, call, he, he's calling. So he says, first of all, you're chosen. Chosen for what? Does, what are we chosen for? From the beginning, chose you for salvation. How? Through sanctification. Now, sanctification is one of those big words we go, whoa, well, what's that one about? Sanctification is a word that means to be set apart. He calls us to be saved, and he does that through this process of setting us apart, Paul says. Well, how'd that happen? He says what? By the Holy Spirit and belief in the truth. Believing, heart believing. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. That's the critical point. Do we believe? And obviously it's a heart belief, not just a mental assent, but a, a surrendering, a trusting, casting all upon him. So you are set apart by the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is the author of, he's the convictor, he's the drawer. Salvation comes through the work of the Holy Spirit. And the word, he uses the truth. And we hear it, we receive it, we believe it. So it's through this belief in the truth. Same for all of us, that that occurs. And then he says, how did all this really happen? He said, to which you are called by our gospel. Gospel is a term for good news. The good news of forgiveness through Jesus Christ. Don't earn it, don't deserve it. It's a gift of God for all who receive. For the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
So, what's he kind of begin here in this section? He said, okay, there are those who reject. There are those who, because of it, they're going to be lost. God doesn't want it, but he lets us choose. And he said, okay, they're going to be lost. He goes, but you guys, he goes, you're beloved by the Lord. And he points out the process, if you will, the steps. And it's true for all believers. We are chosen ones. We're set apart ones. We're called ones by the good news. Toward an end, for the obtaining of the glory of Jesus. Now, let's think about those statements. We get into the heart of this, but think how we kind of, he's throwing this contrast against the others, and he goes, look what God's done in your life. And he goes, look, you're called. You're chosen. You're set apart. And, and it's, it came through this good news, this free gift of God. You received it. For what end? For obtaining the glory of Jesus. You ever have a bad day? If you ever had a bad day, pull this out and think about this one. It's been said that this is like a mini theology right here. A good basic Bible course right there, just the steps. Because we can get our eyes so on the horizontal, and, and it's, it's like, like, like the Thessalonians, they were going through some rough persecution and trials. And we can go through rough stuff in these days. We get challenged a lot. And we can get thrown off or not careful. He begins by saying, remember, what, get the big picture here. How much you're loved by God and what he's done to make you his. And always bring that against the bad day. And watch what that does. Remember these things is the call. But now watch what it leads to. Because verse 15 starts with what? Therefore. Now I say it all the time, but Paul uses that phrase a lot. And what does therefore mean? Therefore means based on what was just said, let the following be the case. Based on this, then this. Based upon the fact that you're called, you're chosen, you're saved, all those awesome things. Therefore, brethren... Stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or epistle. Stand fast and hold on tight. <laughs> Stand fast and hold on. Let's review for just a moment. What, what had happened to the Thessalonians that Paul had to write this to them? Let's consider it. Back at the beginning of chapter 2, and chapter 2, it's agreed, is really the heart of this letter. Again, he's writing, well, let's read it, chapter 2, verse 1. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, that's the rapture, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. So they're shaken. They're troubled because somehow, by a false letter, a letter saying it's from Paul that wasn't, or somebody spoke up and said they were speaking for the Lord who wasn't, or something, but somehow they thought that they had come into the day of the Lord, is the expression that's used there. The term day of the Lord, we saw this last week, but if you weren't here, that's fine, just Kind of, kind of summarizing it. The day of the Lord here is a biblical phrase for the great tribulation period. That period where the church is taken out of here and this world moves into the seven years that are coming where God's going to pour out his judgment on this Christ-rejecting world. It's a, it's a seven-year period that's going to be fulfilled. It was prophesied by Daniel. He prophesied it would be coming, so we've got to set it. God will turn again and deal directly with the Jews during that time and all. And also, at the beginning of that time, there arises a man, man of sin, he's called, man of perdition, called the Antichrist. He's going to come on the scene, and at first, though, he's going to be like the greatest thing since sliced bread, people will think. He will come on the scene, and, and he'll appear to have great answers for all the problems of the world. But halfway through the seven-year period, he'll go into the temple, it tells us in Scripture, He'll set up what's called the abomination of desolation. Basically, he goes in there and says, I'm God, worship me instead of God. And he sets himself up in that place. And Jesus refers to that as the abomination that causes desolation. So that's what's going to be going on. But they, and so they were afraid that, uh-oh, someone had told them, hey, guess what? That's already started. You missed the rapture. You're here. You're going into the great tribulation. And so they're upset. They're troubled. But he goes on in chapter 2 to explain, that can't happen. You're not in it yet. Because the great tribulation won't start. It's going to take two things to happen. In verses 3 and 4, 
Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God or that he was to convey that somehow he believes he's God. So two things must have happened before we enter the great tribulation. Now we, people, church is out of here, before this earth enters the great tribulation. One, he says there has to be a great falling away, the great apostasy it's called. And secondly, the man of sin will have to be revealed. The man of sin will come along. The Antichrist has to be revealed when that kicks off. And then Paul goes on, I'm just summarizing, Paul goes on to explain, and that can't happen. The son of man, this, excuse me, the son of sin, uh, this man of perdition, he can't arise until that which restrains is taken out of the way. And we saw last time through our study that that which restrains is the Holy Spirit in the church, in the believers. So when the church is caught out of here, that restraining influence is removed. Holy Spirit's still here, and we'll be here in believers during, as people receive the Lord but in terms of the influence of the church, that's out of here, the rapture. And man, everything opens up wide. This, this Antichrist is revealed, and off we go at that point. Off they go. So we said that all last week, and you can look at that message and get more deep into it if you choose to. But that's the context. But what I want us to consider here in the context for this morning, for our verses, verse 2 indicates that they were listening to something that they shouldn't be listening to. He's saying, someone has written you or someone has said something, and you are believing it. You're being tempted to really believe this thing. And you're forgetting what I've told you. So you're, you're, for, you're listening to someone you shouldn't, and you're forgetting what you should be paying attention to. That's always a sure recipe for being shaken. Then and now. Remember, look at verse 5. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? See, he's saying you're listening to these people, but you're not listening to what you know and you've been taught. They weren't remembering what Paul had taught them. It's not a newsflash, but we live in a day where we're bombarded with opinions. Bombarded with challenges, challenges to the Bible, challenges to our faith, just challenges to truth. Today, lies are revered, and the truth is denigrated. Evil is called good, and good is called evil, and more and more so. And I suspect that until the Lord comes and takes us home, that things are going to get worse in that regard. Morals, we get more and more worse, and... and uh, you're going to get more and more bombarded by just so many opinions and all this stuff going on. But the point Paul's making, and the point that's important for us is, we don't have to be shaken by it. We don't have to let these things shake us. Because it can, if we're not careful. We, we can start saying, man, it's crazy, and what's going to happen? And we get so worried or something. And he's saying, you don't have to go there. You don't have to get troubled in mind if you remember certain things. We can stand fast. There's a place to stand fast in whatever we face is the awesome message Paul has for us, God has for us. There's something we can stand on, something we can and should hold fast to. So what is it? Let's see what Paul points to. Verse 15. <laughs> Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or or by, or our epistle. So the remedy is what? First thing he says is stand fast. Get a sure footing. Don't get on a slippery slope. Get your feet on a solid foundation. Stand fast. Don't be moved from this, he says. And next, then he says, hold. Hold the traditions. But just take that word hold first. Hold is the idea. It's to hold fast, to get a, get, get a death grip on something. Just grab on something and don't let go of it. So same idea. Stand on this. Hold on to this. And to what? What am I to hold firmly to? It says, to traditions which you were taught, whether by word 
or our epistle. Oh, man. See, someone might say, oh, man, traditions. I don't want to hear about traditions. See, people, when we hear that word right away, some react. They might say, I hate all the religious traditions of man. That's what turned me against so many things that are religious and all. When I see what man does and his traditions and all. I hate the religious traditions of men with their robes and their rituals and all their just spiritual deadness. And so we look at that word and we can get thrown real quick. Do you hate those things? So did Jesus. I'm not going to turn there right now, but you can later look at Mark chapter 7, verses 1 through 13. Go ahead and write that down if you choose to. But in Mark 7, 1 through 13, Jesus really takes the Pharisees to task for laying aside the commandments of God and holding on to the traditions of men. And it knocks the legs right from underneath. All the things you're doing, he says, you guys, you've taken your opinions and traditions and made them as if God was saying them, and you've neglected what God has really said. So Paul's not saying that, oh, go with the ritual, the tradition of man or something. Paul not saying that. Jesus certainly didn't say that. So what does it mean? What do, what's he saying here? What does it mean when he says, and hold the traditions? What does that refer to? Well, what's it say? It's to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or by our letters. See, the word tradition here, translated tradition in the, in the New King James, means that which is handed down from one person to another. That's all he's saying. Hold on to that which was passed on from God to us, to you. In short, we have it now in this form. It's what you're holding if you're holding your Bible. But that's the idea here. So he's not saying follow the traditions. And See, some people jump on this and say, see, and they use to justify all kinds of man's things. But that's, he says, no, hold on to what you've been taught by the apostles through word. Remember, at the, they didn't have the New Testament when they went out. The New Testament was busy being put together. This letter would become part of the New Testament. But when Paul first walked into Thessalonica, it was verbal. The gospel was conveyed in a, an oral means. Now, he could take the Old Testament, and he often could and did, and we know that in other letters, and go back and show all the prophecies telling about Jesus, the Messiah. And he would often go into the synagogues to show the Jews, hey, Jesus is a fulfillment of all this. So he had the Old Testament writings. But in terms of the gospel and Jesus and the price of the cross and all, that first was an oral message. Later, the Holy Spirit caused it to be written down, like this letter, like the letter we're looking at right now. But that's what he's talking about. What we've taught you in terms of first the oral, declaring of the good news, and the letters we've since written to you, including this one. That's what traditions here refers to. Don't think it's saying some man-made system or something. He's saying, it's, it's, tradition here is a word that means that which you've been told by us, word or letter. In essence, he's saying, hold on to the things that I've talked to you about, that I've told you, the truth that I pointed to. Hold on to those. Don't list just anybody that comes along. Someone just because they walk into town and says they're from God. Search the scriptures and see if they're so, like the Bereans did. See if it really is, lines up with his word. Hold on to those things. But now notice where he goes next. He doesn't stop right there. For we see that it's not just a head knowledge of the truth. Remember, Paul has already said what? You heard it, you believed it. You heart believed this. Only then he says, now you believe it, stand on it. He just said, stand on it, hold it firmly. But now he takes it one step further, verses 16 and 17. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and Father, who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace. See, Paul's praying here. What's he pray? May Jesus and God the Father do what? 
May he comfort your hearts. Remember, they're troubled. Comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Paul says, in light of all this, he said, I pray two things for you. Now, may the Lord. So he's praying this for them. Now, what's, what's he basically pray? That the Lord will comfort you and he will establish you. I want you to hold on. I want you to stand strong. And I pray he's going to comfort you in all these trials you're going through, all these challenges to the truth and everything else. I want you to be comforted. He's going to, I pray he'll comfort you, and they'll also establish you in every good word and work. Now, again, contrast this with verse 2. How had he found them? What, what was he hearing was going on with them? Shaken. Shaken in mind, troubled. So what's he say? He now says, look, instead of being shaken, we can be established. Instead of being troubled, we can be comforted in our hearts. But it's going to depend on who we look to, who we believe, who we trust, where we put our feet, so to speak. So we praise that we would have comforted hearts and be established. And notice, established in what? In every good word and work. So now we see an important point. As I said, he didn't just say, okay, you believed. Now stand and hold on tight. But now it's supposed to result in something. It's supposed to result in comforted hearts and established word and work. There's going to be a work in us, but there's going to be a work through us in this whole holding on. In the midst of all that we're facing, in the midst of all the trials and persecutions, yep, so I want to work not just in you, but through you in all that. Because others need to know. They need to see within a place they can put their feet also. They need to find a place of comfort all around us. So Paul says, okay, you believed it. Then he says, stand on it. Now he says what? Live it. You believed it. Stand on it. Hold on to it. But now live it. It's a living faith. If that's the case, it should be a faith that looks like something. It should result in works. I sometimes see people doing all these gymnastics and politics and all saying, well, I'm a believer, but it won't affect what I do. Don't worry, I, I can be a good judge. I can be a good senator. I won't let my faith affect my, my decisions and all. I, I'm of the opinion it's a pretty poor faith that doesn't affect what you do, how you see things. It, it's supposed to affect us. And he's saying it will, and that's going to be a good thing, as we see here. So this living faith is to result in works. It will look like something through us. It'll have an effect in us, comforting us, and through us, establishing us in word and works. Believe it, guard it, but also do it. Remember what James taught us? Here we go. (laughs) But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, Deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This one will be blessed in what he does. So Paul was concerned with both aspects, if you will, of our Christian life. The word and the work. Our beliefs, our heart, what we're rooted on, we're founded in. But also, don't be like those who Forget and go out and just, and it makes no difference. But be a doer of it. It's supposed to look like something as we, for our good in this world, needs to see it. So 
He's speaking about the word and the work, every good word and work. They're saying it and they're doing it is the idea. Our walk and our talk must agree. Those who hold fast to the word will have mouths and lives that show it. This is all true. And it's worthy of being and basing a life upon and being lived out. I read a story of a man who was, a, he was a pastor, and he went to a well-known actor, and he asked the actor, he said, how come you, you get out, you perform before great crowds, and you're just performing fiction? He goes, I speak the truth, and nobody comes out to hear it. Why is that, he asked the actor. And the actor said, well, here's what I think. I can tell the difference between me and you. He says, I act out fiction as if it's truth. You preach truth as if it's a fiction. You got to believe it. He said, you got you to make sure you believe it first. And people watch us. We're, we're, we're the fifth gospel, as it said. They, do you really believe it? Paul's saying, it's supposed to look like something. And I've said it sounds so basic for a pastor to say, but <laughs> he's really there. I remember when he broke through and showed me, he's really there. And he had such love and, and joy and forgiveness. And uh, There's so much we can dig into, spend a lifetime studying and not accomplish it all. So much to grow in. But he, the, the basic is, he's really there. <laughs> and he wants to have that ongoing personal fellowship. Of course, we're called to gather together like this. That's great. But don't let this be the sum total. Fellowship's important, but that's not the whole. This is not the relationship here. Don't let this substitute for this. Nurture the real, the personal. Nurture that relationship. And if we do, he's saying, it's going to look like something. Thank God for how very, very real he is to us, that he's available to us. This morning, are we shaken or established? Are we troubled or are we comforted? It will be decided whether we are remembering or forgetting what God has said. And then bring that to bear upon our circumstances. Which, what will we look, what glasses do we have on as we observe things going on in our lives, coming our way? We need to take it through the, the lenses of his love, his word. If we're shaken or comforted, troubled, whichever it is, it be decided whether we're standing and, and, and holding fast to the word, to what he's done, what he said to us. Or whether we get pulled by every new theory that comes down the road. Let's take a few minutes here for application. Notice his prayer, Paul's prayer in verse 16. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord himself, and our God and Father who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace. She says, may Jesus, the Lord Jesus, may God our Father, did you notice the tense? Who has loved us and given us. It, He's not praying that that he would. He's saying he's basing his prayer upon the fact that God already has. May the God who's done this do this. What I'm saying, he points to the character and the nature and the work of God already accomplished in our lives as the basis for seeking God's continued work. Important, important point. We sit here already loved. He has already given us this everlasting consolation. We have a good hope, a living hope. As Paul prays that the Lord would comfort and all these things, he, said, he starts by reminding us of God's past faithfulness. Of God's blessings, his, even his current blessings. And, what, and by, 
by what means did he receive all this? How did he receive all this consolation and good hope? Because we're just so cute. Well, no. No, it's because you're so smart. No. It's because your income exceeds the people sitting around you. No. Because you live in this house. Drive that car. No, it's not what the world, it's none of those things. By what means does, did, I, did you and I receive this consolation, this good hope? By grace. His undeserved favor towards us. That's why I can go to him in my struggles, my shortcomings, my failures, just as I am. I can come and plead my case, and I can base it, Lord, upon your faithfulness, upon your nature, your character, your promises. I can go with you, you on this, because it's all by grace, Lord. But I can look to your future faithfulness because of your past and current faithfulness, and you don't change. You don't lie. You're not going to leave or forsake me. So that's the first thing I want us to see. We can come, and Paul does that. He comes asking his prayer based upon what he's found in God. When we're bombarded with all these things, make sure we do the same. Come to God based on what we've already found, what he's already done. We, he's loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope. Hmm. And, and, and again, by, it's the only way this can happen. The only way this can all happen is by grace. As we face the future, let us remember the grace and the past and continual faithfulness of God. But now a second application before we wrap up our time. I feel led to emphasize this one point a little further, and it's still kind of percolating with me, but this is where I'm at with it as of this morning really began to hit me last night. I was going through my notes and kind of restudying and all. And uh, I mean, I study through the week as the Lord allows, and I dig in and all, et cetera. And Saturday night, I kind of sit down and really try to finalize things and look at it all. And, but last night, it really just started really kind of hitting me. And let's just consider this. We saw earlier in verses 10 through 12 of this chapter, we saw that those who perish... Don't receive the love of the truth. We saw that they, they believe a lie. They did not believe the truth. They don't want to believe God, take him out of his word. They'd rather believe something from somebody out here or something else. In contrast, we saw, Paul says of the Thessalonians, they were set apart by the spirit and belief in the truth. So again, we come back to that application. The contrasting thing is, well, the one group just wouldn't believe, wouldn't trust God, his word, the truth, Paul calls it. But you, he says to them, you do believe it. And therefore, hold on to it. Stand fast on it. And let it work in and through you, these things that, that God wants to do. Let him comfort you and, and establish you in your, in your word and your work and all. All because of believers. I, I sometimes use that word. We often do. That we are believers. We're followers. We're not just mental agreeers. We're believers. Heart believers. What do we believe? We believe the truth. We believe in. We believe on the Lord. We, we believe. We take him out as we found. That is truth. He is truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life, as he said. Do we believe it? And that's rhetorical. <laughs> so it's important we challenge ourselves right away. There's nothing else worthy of being having that place. There's nothing, it's all thinking sand except him. We think of that message he gave about build your house on this, on the rock, he says. And so we sit here this morning saying, we do. Lord, I do believe it. Come a certain distance, got a certain distance to go, but I know this, I've settled the issue. I believe it. Make sure you settle the issue. You're going to find here in a couple of weeks, it's on my heart. I mentioned it a while back. It's on my heart, in a, depending on how we're going here, it looks like we're another week or two out of finishing this letter, that we're going to do something we haven't done around here. I think back a long time. I guess I never have, but we're going to step outside. Because typically, we go through the Bible verse by verse, book by book. But because of what I see going on in our culture and what I see how things are going so 
we know how they're going. I think it's important that we settle some issues in ourselves. So we're going to enter a, a week. I don't know how long it's going to last us, but I want to go back to really going through some Bible boot camp stuff. I think it'll really behoove us because with the challenges that are coming and will be coming, might as well settle it now. Just get it settled as to what God's Word says. See, it's not a smorgasbord. We don't pick and choose. Well, I'm not going to follow that. The same Lord that loves us says all that He says, and we've got to know it so we can stand strong in it. Some of my heart's take some time, so the next couple of weeks we're going to jump into it. Don't know how long it'll go. But we're going to talk about the foundations, the basics. It's on my heart that we settle some issues and make sure it's settled so that when this world gets crazier and crazier, it doesn't throw us. So Lord willing, I pray you might want to, and I encourage you to pray. You want to jump on board with us as we get the basics settled. Some for it's just review. Some will be new. But for all of us, it'll be, but I know that I know this. So when the lies come, we'll know that they are just that. They're lies. We can stand on the truth. But for this morning, he says, you believe it? He says, you believe it. He's talked about it. You guys believe it. Now make sure you're standing on it. Get anchored on it. Make sure you lay hold of it. Grab on with that death grip. Don't let go of it. And if you really believe it, your life is going to show it. So Paul says what? Go live it. Stand on it. <laughs> hold on to it. Share it. Live it. Verse 15. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions. Remember the things that we taught you, which you were taught, whether by word or epistle. Now, may our Lord Jesus Christ... You know what? Stop. Stand up a minute, please. If we're going to wrap up. Our, where's the team? You can go ahead and come on up. As everybody stands, though, Now, may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and Father, who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. In all we face, let's be found standing fast and holding the traditions that we've been taught in God's word. Heavenly Father, thank you, thank you for all we find in you, all you've done for us, the love you've poured out upon us. Thank you for how very faithful you are, for the hope, all we found in you, through grace, we give you praise. Now, Lord, as we head out, Lord, as the world bombards us with all this stuff, for those who are struggling with different things even now, Lord, comfort, establish, encourage, Lord. And thank you, Lord. Thank you that, well, for all you've done, and you're not about to stop now. All glory to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Need prayer this morning? There'll be prayer partners here in the sanctuary. If you're watching the streaming, call on the church number. There's people who love to pray with you. May the Lord bless you and guide you as you go forward in, in your Jericho Road journey with him. Let's close in song.